Welcome to E3. When you are born again, you, are, you have been accepted the way you are. Rugged and dirty, the way you are, you have been accepted. So it is not this works that makes you born again. It is your acceptance, or let me use the word faith, in the finished work of Jesus. That brings you into the born again experience. On the part of God, it's a complete work. It's a complete work. But you must grow. How do you grow? You find out what God's word says about your new state. And you align your mind and your body to that word. You know, knowing what Christ has done for you is just information. But knowing how to activate it into your reality is revelation. Crazy things we did. If you are in the village, there's one witch that your village is afraid of. When you got born again, you want to go and encounter him. You go to his house. Hey, 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 I've come to the fire that I now carry. Actually, you are on fire at that time. You know, God will just be respecting you and say, this is my baby. I don't want anything to happen to him. So you just say, what? Well, it happened. You just say, rain, don't fall. It stops falling. You just say, hey, uh, my enemies die with fire. And unfortunately for you, one of your, somebody who offended you that you had in mind when you were saying, oh, my enemies died by fire. He, fire attacked his house and burnt all his things. You say, oh, my God, oh, my God. Is this thing, you know, God, you are just being pampered. But guess what? When the children entered the wilderness, what happened? The manna seized. Say the manna seized. The quail seized. Say the quail seized. The water from the spring seized. The water from the spring, what? Why? When you are a child, you are provided for. But when you are an adult, you provide for yourself. When they entered the promised land, what did he tell them? Prepare your sword with one hand. Go in and conquer. Go in and conquer. You see why now when rain, you know why people like us now when rain is solid, we don't bother speaking in tongues and say, Lord, rain should not fall because God will never hear. <laughs> we did it in those days. God will not hear. He will not. Say, rain, stop. Is there no umbrella? <laughs> Are you not in the rainy season? You know, it's like some young Christians, we plan crusade in the in heart of June, July. A crusade, open air. They want to test the efficacy of the word. Then when rain starts falling, you think that it was by anointing that the Archbishop makes sure that all our national convention is in November. You think it was by anointing. Is it not the same as that used to command rain not to fall for several days and rain will not fall? It was not by anointing, it was by wisdom. So oh, let's put our, when we are going to get married, we wanted an open hair reception. Uh, we went to meet um, Mrs. Oki, Patsy, and she told us if you want an open hair reception, you must put it beyond October. Beyond October. Praise God. Because when you become an adult, the manner will cease. The manna will cease. You will start cooking your own meals. You know, I have said things like, oh, have you seen anybody that prayed and money? God, actually, even me, it has happened to me. It has happened to me. You know, I remember when I was in Port Harcourt, I was going to come to Benin. And you know what? My car was not good. I was driving that 1986 car. I have told you people that story of that car. My car was bad. I didn't have a dime with me. I needed to put the car in order and buy fuel. No money. I didn't know what to do. And I said, God, help me. God, help me. I need this thing. I need this thing. Do you know what happened? God did. He put money in my pocket. I was just checking my clothes, and I saw money. The exact money that would buy me fuel, fix my tires, and drive me to Benin. How many of you have had those experiences? It's your manner experience, though. It's your manner experience. It's your manner experience. Oh, believe me. See, you see, we are all adults here. Imagine if your father is here and he's carrying you on his laps. They'll say you are retarded, right? You know that spiritual growth has a lifespan. There is, a, there is an age you get to. You are expected to be an adult. That's why many prophets who jump into lion's den to prove that the God of Daniel is alive, they prove it in their graves. It was, there was one in Ibadan. He entered the zoo. He said, the God, he said, it's Prophet Daniel. 
He wants to prove that the God of Daniel is alive. He forgot that he's no longer in the, in the desert where God prepares his meal for him in the presence of his enemies. Now he has to prepare his meals himself. So he jumped into the lion's den, and the lion had been fed, so the lion was indifferent. And look at how is this person that is so bold. Rawr, rawr, rawr. You are so bold, you are coming to my den. And the man was now taking his cross. You know all those are large cross. He said, ah, the God of Daniel is alive. The God of Daniel. He said, yeah. you enter my cage. I see the not mine. Then you now have the effrontery to be trying to kill me with your sword. Ah. The lion tore the man. It was his body part they picked out of the zoo. I'm sure some of you heard that story. Praise God. So, you know, many of those things we are doing is because we are in our childhood infancy stage and God is overlooking. When you move out of the wilderness, when you are no longer a child, you prepare your meals, you work your miracles. That's why I say I don't wait for miracles. I believe in God, I believe in miracles. But I don't wait for them because I'm no longer a babe. And if you think what I'm saying is wrong, go to Hebrews chapter 6 from verse 1. Hebrews 6.1. Therefore, let's leave the principle of the doctrine of Christ, the principles of the doctrine of Christ, the foundation of the doctrine. See, you know, by our works today, there is no doctrine that is a principle that we should leave. There are some people that quarrel every day that people like us, that we are not preaching the gospel, that what we preach is, is uh, you know, they say, oh, they give us all manner of names. You get it? But this is what Paul said. He said you should leave those principles. What are the principles? Not laying again the foundation of repentance from the dead. There are people who, you see them on social media that, oh, you are not preaching repentance from the dead. You are not preaching the gospel. Abi, uh, faith towards God, doctrine of baptisms, laying on of hands. There are people who are angry that I don't lay hands. I don't lay hands to do miracles. Some people stop coming. You know what they say about this church? They say this church is people that don't have problems that go there. You see, it? what is Paul saying here? That we should leave all these things. Resurrection from the dead. Can you imagine? Is this not all the doctrine that we preach in church? <laughs> Amen. And of eternal judgment. Praise God. You know, this is what I used to confirm people who believe in eternal security. I said the fact, the, the fact that the Bible says that of eternal salvation, or it, the, it, eternal, is it eternal salvation? Yes, of eternal salvation. The, the fact that the phrase was used... It's not to be interpreted in the way it's interpreted that once you are born again, you are, you are born again. No matter what happens, if you like, go to Jesus and curse him, spit on his grave. You can never be unborn again because the word eternal salvation was used. Eternal judgment was used. So I just ask them a simple question. Does eternal judgment, taking clue from eternal salvation, from your own interpretation, does eternal judgment also mean that once you are not born again, you are in a set of judgments? Of course, you know that. When you are not born again, you have been judged already. Are you here, please? Does it not mean that that judgment is eternal also? That you are in a set of judgment so you remain like that for the rest of your life? There is nothing you will do to make you save? So that shows the flaw in the, in the doctrine of eternal security. Praise God. But that's not my subject for today. Let's go on. And this we will do if God permits. Verse 4. For it's impossible. Just read it. That scripture is very clear. That Look, we should leave the foundations and go on to greater things, unto perfection. Praise God. Praise God. So many of the things you've enjoyed is because you are a child. So you must grow. And when you grow, you will defend yourself. How do you defend yourself? Don't walk into danger in the name of being anointed. If armed robbers come to your house and you have a gun, pluck their head before they pluck you. John, are you here? After all, it was God. The father himself that told Joseph, run with the child because they are seeking to kill the child. He didn't say, I am God. Odechi, if they caught me, it will not enter. Are you here? Am I speaking to people with... Praise God. So the human person, of course, like I've said so many times, is a soul. So the physical food we eat is manifested in physical development and the spiritual food, which is the word of God, is manifested in development of our mind, which in turn regulates our actions and behavior. Therefore, spiritual growth and maturation is the degree to which we allow the word of God form our worldview, the degree to which you see the world 
against the backdrop of scriptures. Do you get it? Are we together? That's why in my own world, it's not an argument whether is it a sin to, uh, to, have, to have sex with someone who is not your wife. It's not a subject because I have a worldview. I have a worldview. It's very clear. I have a, see, there is, see, in scripture, scripture is black and white. There's no middle ground. So I have a worldview. So I see my world against that background. Does it mean that you are going to hell because you are sleeping with, not, not explicitly, not explicitly, but if you are still doing it, just show that you have remained, you have refused to grow, you have remained as a baby, and you are a distress to your father. I mean, if you have seen a five-year-old child, six-year-old, ten-year-old, that is not yet working, it's a distress. And you know, in interpretation of dreams, sometimes when you see yourself carrying a baby in your dream, is a sign of stress. Stress. Because you know a baby is 100% desiring of attention. So it's a sign of a body. There's a body you are carrying. Am I communicating, please? Not in all cases. So don't say that's a general rule. So when you see your ch- yourself carrying a child, but typically most times when you are carrying a child, it's a symbol of burden. You are carrying a burden that you need to either let go or do something about. Praise God. Are you here? So when you are still doing all those things that you are not supposed to do, you are just being a child. And when you are a child, you are when you should have been an adult, you are being a burden to your parent. You are being a burden to your parent. So what do we do? as children that want to grow. We must study the word of God because in it we have life. For the word of God is the food of the soul. Is the food of the soul. Is the food of the human spirit. So eat it. That's why the Bible says to Ezekiah, he said that once we are found and I ate them. And God showed Ezekiah the scroll and said, take them, chew it. That's how the word, you should eat the word. Because when you take God's word, it balances you up psychologically. And that's what spiritual growth is about. When you have a deep sense of balance, a deep sense of balance, you are in control of your life. That's what spiritual growth is about. Praise God. It's not because you can raise the dead. It's not because you can raise the dead. You know, the archbishop told us, of, as anointed as he was, when they called him once to come and pray for one general of Asia, one church, he said when he went there, when he saw the condition, he said, this one is gone. Oh. Why not rush him to the hospital? They said, no, 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 no. In their church, they don't believe in taking drugs. It's against their sin, their doctrine. Whereas the, the man that was dying was wearing glasses. So the other said, what are you wearing? He said, his glass is medicated. He said, yeah. he said, the word medicated means medicinated. That means that when you put on this glass, you are eating medicine permanently. As I'm here now, I'm on drugs. This. I'm on drugs. See it? See the drug? Yeah. You are wearing, you are on drug, and you say you don't take drug. Why are you deceiving yourself? You better take this man to the hospital, otherwise, not go in there, so. And of course, the man died. Of course, the man died. Praise God. There are privileges you enjoy when you are in your growth stage. When you are in your growth stage, that's when God will give you pillar of fire by day, by night, and pillar of cloud by day. That's how it is at that stage. You will walk around the wall shouting, just making noise, praise God, speaking in tongues, speaking in tongues, and the wall of Jericho will fall. It's when you are. <laughs> but when you enter the promised land, are you in the promised land? The Hittites will attack you. The Jebusites, we attack. The Assyrians, we attack. And the kind of attack, it's not praise God that conquers it. It's the sword of the spirit. (laughs) You must be armed. You must be armed. So many of the struggles we are going through, and we are thinking that God has... Is it not Paul, the apostle, the mightiest of them all, that said that there is a thorn in his flesh that God refused to give him answer to? 
When, when he asked God, God, why are you doing this to me? God says, look, you have grace. That grace is enough power for you to go through. It's sufficient for you. It's sufficient. It's sufficient. So we must grow up. We must grow up as Christians. And that growth is manifested by the degree to which we allow God's word. Until you get to that point where you make a commitment to yourself that once I find it in God's word, I will do it. Once I find it in God's word, I will do it. Yeah, there are understanding and misunderstanding and interpretational problems. But God's word is very clear in scriptures. And that's, when, that's the point I got to in my life. When I said, look, if I see it written down in the Bible, I don't care, I don't care what contemporary thoughts is. I will stick to it. I will stick to it. And that is the definition of spiritual maturity. So when you are mature, what do you do? You spend time daily with the world because you must live, right? And blessed are they who do the word, not just here. So when you spend time daily, you allow yourself to live it. You work it out, right? What I'm telling you now is what you do when you are growing, for you to grow spiritually and for you to remain mature. Spend time with the word, read the word every day, and act it out. How do you act it out? You act it out by being it and by sharing it. That's how you act it out. And the third thing is, it's not good for a man to be alone, so God made him a help meet. And God caused all the animals to go to them to find out what he would call them. And whatever he called them, that they became. Man was made to be social in nature. And Paul said, forsake not the assembling of yourself together as the man of some is. So as part of your experience in spiritual growth, you must, you must engage in fellowship. You must engage in fellowship. Praise God. You must engage in fellowship. Don't break fellowship. Praise God. Are we together here? You must engage in fellowship. I've spoken about living the word, right? Are we here? Living the word, as in reading the word. Read it. And I've told you guys many times, the best way to read the word is read it like you are reading a newspaper. I'm telling you. Read it like you are, all those spiritual, you are looking for spiritual meanings. Don't look for. The word, you see, the Bible was written in English, black and white. When the Bible says, faith cometh by hearing, it means faith cometh by hearing. It's called letterism in, in the idea of doctrinal interpretation. Faith cometh by hearing means faith cometh by hearing. Praise God now. Are we together, please? So read it like you are reading a newspaper. You know, after you have read it like you are reading a newspaper, as you keep reading, you keep getting new insights. New understanding. But first, read it like you are reading a newspaper. The fourth thing you should do is devotion. That's prayer. Say devotion. Say devotion. You know, in this church, people say we don't like prayers. But I tell people I'm a prayer warrior, even though I don't shout all the time. And when people challenge me that, oh, you don't like prayer, you don't like prayer, you don't like prayer, I show them what my devotion, the product of my personal devotion, the result. So what, what, what's the intent of the prayers, prayers, prayers? Praise God. It's connecting with your father. It's connecting with your, your source. So when I say prayer, it could be a, a time of intense quietness. You know, Pentecostal, when we say prayer, is when you, in the morning, 5 a.m., hey, hey, the whole street will know that you are, you are woken up. When I was in Oweri, there's a man that used to ring bell and uh, explode banger in prayers. <laughs> He's praying. He's praying. You know, the banger will not explode. Boom! You not shout, fire! That's prayers. He's praying. It's, it's a time of intense devotion. And you know the way we pray now? You know the way we pray? You know, in Pentecostal movement, we have prayer language. I know that's what Jesus was showing between the two men that went to the temple. One of them was a Pentecostal. He had prayer language. The other one was just a publican who just want any other guy that just came to just say, God, you know, say, sorry, I'm not vexed. May I tell you, you know, say me, I'll be a bad guy. But I recognize you as my father and I need help. Help me. As simple as that. What did Jesus say? Who was justified? Who was justified means whose prayer was answered? Whose prayer was answered? There is no special prayer language. 
There is no special prayer language. You know, forget what you see when we come up here and say all those highfalutin spiritual words. You know, you know, you declare you with a voice that makes you look like a man of God. And that voice always betrays me. Every time people see me in the office, when they just say, are you a pastor? You know, you, don't, you know what they expect me? I'll not be feeling that. <laughs> the anointing on me is very strong. When people just see me, they recognize me. It's a, it's a daily problem I have. It's daily. That's, I'm talking of my colleagues. Recently, auditors came to my office two weeks ago, and after they interacted with me, what they said is that, are you a pastor? I said, why are you asking? Yes, I am. They said, ah, no wonder. No wonder. It's just written all over you. You know, I didn't want to deceive myself to say, ah, man, <laughs> I'm anointed. They see the anointing. It's, it's, the anointing is physical. It's obvious. I say, I am very sure. I will do for that research on that, but I am very sure that I have a voice that is pastoral. <laughs> so when I just talk, they will sense the authority in the voice. They say, this guy must be a pastor. And they always catch me. I'm not saying the anointing is not there. The anointing is there. The anointing brings you favor and all those things. It's there, but <sighs> praise God. Let us grow up. You need a time of intense devotion. You need a time of peace of the spirit. A time of quietness that you are alone. No phone and just be there. And, and you know what? As you make it, see, actually, that is how you harmonize your work. The, the, you reduce differences between your belief system and your lifestyle. It's a time of intense devotion. Some people, spiritual people, will call it a time of consecration. Intense devotion. Just keep quiet. Don't shout. Don't be jumping, speaking in tongues and jumping from one place to another. No, 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 no. It's not a time of noise. A time of intense devotion. So how do you grow spiritually? And you know, in those times, I've told you guys, prayer is in the revelation equation. So I've told you guys that in those times of intense devotion, what are you gaining? You are gaining insight. You are gaining alignment. You are, you are developing your extra sensory perception. Your sense of connection with your father, which is God. You are developing it. You are developing it. Praise God. That's why when I have challenges, and I, in my time of devotion, I get direct clear-cut answers. Clear-cut. I want to do an investment. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm a bit sure, not sure. At night, I wake up when everywhere is quiet. Nobody is looking. Nobody knows. And I sit down. I just introspect, meditate, and talk to God. You know, I could be sitting now for one hour, and all I've said, Father, I need your intervention now. That's all I have said. That's all I have said. And you know what? Usually, my experience is that, you know, at such times, it's as if the windows of heaven is let loose, and your head is barraged with concepts and ideas and solutions that when you act on any of them, you now, when you have acted, you now say, I'm actually a very spiritual, I close, I, I, I be prophet, I close to God. But I want to be a prophet to myself first before I be a prophet to others. So I don't want to make a merchandise of people. Praise God. That's why you don't see me come here and say, uh, say some kind of funny, funny testimony so that I can enslave your mind so you cannot think. In the days of being a child, God will overlook and pamper you. You will poo-poo on your body, he will clean it up. 